Welcome to the Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you find yourself in this entire world, I welcome you. Hello, my friend. I do hope this week finds you well and safe. There are certain situations in our grieving process that test our souls. And what I'd like to talk to you about today does just that. One of the most difficult decisions we make after a loved one's death is when and if to part with their belongings or possessions. And sometimes this situation comes up very soon after the person is buried by well-meaning relatives and friends who believe it will be easier on you if their photos and belongings are moved out of the way or packed up and placed somewhere else than where they had been left when they died. But until you, and only you, have a chance to even comprehend what has happened and emerged from the shock of your loss, will you do anything with those possessions and photos? If you are a friend or relative listening to me now, Please understand me when I say, in the strongest sense, that it is not your place, no matter how well-intentioned you are, to touch or move any photo, piece of clothing, tool, memorabilia, furniture, vehicle, or anything else, even the littlest thing, from the place where you found it because those decisions are not for you to make. Those decisions are up to the person who is now grieving. And believe me when I say that you as the grieving individual have many options, and the last thing I want you to feel is regret over giving away possessions too soon when you aren't yet thinking clearly. This is something you need to do in your own time, in your own privacy, when you feel more emotionally stable. Now, some family members and friends actually think if they rid the room of all the pictures and memorabilia, somehow you won't be as upset. Yes, they are trying to make you feel better. They want to do what is best for us, but in that process, oftentimes they are really doing what is better for them, what actually makes them feel more comfortable. Please remember that out of sight does not mean out of mind. Belongings are very precious possessions. Having pictures out may be extremely cathartic for you. It is not uncommon to stand there and talk to the picture of your loved one when you need to talk to them. It's not uncommon at all. And many might think that sounds crazy, but actually, it's very sane. It makes them still feel alive and your relationship is still going on. And you need that. 
for a good long while. Having their belongings in the closet so that you can smell how he or she smelled and embracing the clothing will help comfort you. Some have taken those clothes to the bed at night to hug them, even warn them while sobbing. And even teens and children have borrowed clothing of their parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters, or other relatives so they could grieve their death. So whatever you do, do not do anything with a loved one's belongings until everyone has gone home from the funeral. Don't wash any piece of clothing or give anything away until you are stronger and thinking more clearly. Most people aren't aware of the pain they can cause if they tamper with a deceased person's belongings. Yes, they might mean well, as we've said, but you can cause significant emotional pain that the survivor never had to endure. So stay clear of laundering, moving, packing up, or giving away a single item. It is not your place. And please realize that it's not just you, as an adult, who will be comforted by using, wearing, holding, enjoying, looking at, playing with, touching, hugging, embracing of an object belonging to the person who died. Children especially look for ways to comfort themselves. They will wear the clothing of their deceased sibling or parent. A wife may wear her husband's shirts. A child will hug a teddy bear that was meant for a new sibling who was miscarried or stillborn. A wife or older child may wear their husband or father's pajamas, even their grandfather's. Maybe grandmother had a favorite sweater that she used while knitting, and her granddaughter would feel so connected and loved by wearing it now. That garment may be two sizes too big for you, but it doesn't matter. It is the smell and softness that holds the memories. For the young men in your life, it might be the baseball or football jerseys or caps of their dads or their army fatigues and medals. If a child or teen died, it might be their sports or academic trophies that will bring great pride. And it's not just clothing. Music that was collected and now shared can bring great joy even through the tears. I remember the day we buried my grandfather. I was in the limousine after the church service, and now we were driving to the cemetery. My grandmother, who sat next to me, took her engagement ring off her finger and handed it to me. I was completely perplexed. Why are you giving me your ring now? I asked her. She told me that Grandpa and she had decided that if he died first, she would give me her engagement ring when he died. I have to tell you, I thought this was pretty ludicrous. I could see if my grandmother died, then my grandfather might give me her ring then. But not while she was still alive. I remember saying, Grandma, why don't you keep it until you go, and then you can leave it for me. Well, no, that didn't work. She insisted that I take it now, and she would still be wearing her wedding band. I really didn't have a choice in the matter, as her mind was made up. And I took a deep breath, and I placed it on my finger so I wouldn't lose it. I wore it on the third finger of my left hand to honor my grandfather, but after a while, I'd only wear it when I got to see her. But when she died, 15 years after him, I started wearing it again from her death all through the funeral and burial and every day for the next year and a half. I can still see myself in the shower, holding my hand up, looking at the ring with the water from the showerhead mixing with my tears. 
I was making the decision if that day was the day I took the ring off. I stood there for so long. I don't know how long. I just remember when I slid her ring off, I remember saying, Thank you, Grandma, for all your love and for the memories we shared. I will miss you forever. And I still do. Grandma's engagement ring lives in my jewelry box now. And when I see it, I smile. I haven't worn it in a long while. I believe the last time was when my niece married, and I wanted my grandmother to be a part of that day. So you see, possessions are very important and to be cherished. Do not take them lightly. As I've said in previous episodes, there are no shoulds in grief. We all grieve in various ways and over different periods of time, and so it is with possessions. Over the years, I've often been asked, when is the right time to release a person's possessions? And the answer is, exactly when and if it feels right to you. There are widowed men and women who are older and never plan to remarry, and if that's the case, they may choose to leave all their spouse's belongings right where they are. Others, at a certain time, will pack some up and put them in the attic or basement or in another closet. Some have sorted through their things and decided they wanted to give certain pieces of jewelry, clothing, tools, medals, and other special items to certain members in their family. Some have even done this intentionally as gifts at holidays, even the anniversary of their loved one's death. When a baby dies, the parents have the difficult task of deciding whether to keep their room intact. Well-meaning relatives might tell them to take everything down, disassemble the crib, the mobile, and give away all the clothing, diapers, and other products. But no one can tell grieving parents when the right time to do that might be. And this will take a long time because their dream of holding their baby is no more. And no one ever, ever thinks something as horrific as losing a baby will ever happen. A mother, who along with her husband, has to take down such a room, was far along in her pregnancy. She may have even given birth to a stillborn baby. Everything in this scenario rips at your heart for the loss of that life. Some, in this case, might have been fortunate to take photos with their little one who died right at the hospital. Those photos were kept in a keepsake box along with locks of hair, if possible, and a footprint. Other special objects can be added, maybe a small stuffed animal that was awaiting them. To endure the death of a life before, during, or after birth is so painful, and I send you my love. When an older child or teen dies, there are many times when parents choose to leave their room as it was when they died. Other siblings and even parents might wear their clothing to feel close to them, as we said. They might need to sit in their room just to simply comprehend what has happened. Losing a child at any age is a difficult process and not the order of life. Parents and grandparents are supposed to die first, or at least that's what we would like to believe. But unfortunately, that is not the case. And when a parent dies, it is sometimes difficult because children want certain things that their parents owned. Without a will and a detailed list of how things should be sorted, hurt feelings can arise among siblings. How unfortunate this can be. If this has happened to you, remember to use the emotional freedom technique often so you can deal with this pain and also take box rescue remedy 
to calm down your system, anxiety, and upset. And then there are sticky situations where step parents are involved who have lived with your parent for decades. They are entitled to make decisions based upon your parents' wishes. It is not up to you, as their children, to grab what you think was meant for you. Make your wishes known in a civil manner. You might learn that what you wished for was planned for you anyway. Be kind. Everyone is grieving. Let's also discuss why it is so difficult to release their things. For some, it can be guilt because they feel they would be getting rid of the person themselves, like they would be erasing them from their lives. They just don't feel they can part with any of their things. They feel immobilized because they can't choose what to keep and what to give away. The scent on their clothing comforts them, and they are afraid the scent will fade. And, of course, relatives are making them feel very badly because they feel it's time to release or pack things away. So what are ways to handle this? Well, first of all, you don't have to do everything all at once. You can purge in stages. No one said it all has to be done in one sitting. Give to others intentionally, to those who will use them and appreciate them, whether that is your relatives or even people who survived fires and hurricanes and tornadoes and need clothing, coats, and shoes. I've heard of many who have had their clothing turned into quilts or pillowcases from the shirts and other garments that belong to your loved one. Such a nice idea. Don't be afraid to cry through this process, even if it's been many, many years since they died. You will know in your soul if it is the right time, and don't you dare feel guilty. Losing someone so close to you is one of the most difficult things we have to go through as human beings. And parting with their belongings is not something to be done hastily. Remember, there is nothing wrong with you. Take your time. Share with those who love them. So now it's time to get up. Move our bodies and dance, dance, dance. And I know you probably think this is a little strange, but just do it anyway, okay? Thank you for joining me today. Remember to write five things in your journal each evening that you are grateful for. Visit my website, marymac.info, for your free book. Please rate and review my podcast wherever you listen to me. And share with those who will benefit from it. And as always, remember to be happy because you deserve to. I'll speak to you again soon.